Elizabeth Rush couldn't sleep. It was really early in the morning, and I felt like a kid on Christmas who just kept waking up and is like, is it Christmas yet? No, it wasn't Christmas. It was February 2019, and Elizabeth was aboard a special ship called an icebreaker at the western edge of Antarctica. Sometime between 4 or 5 in the morning, I woke up. You know, there's not really night in Antarctica at this time of year, but it's a little bit darker uh, at this time of day. After a month at sea, she was about to witness something nobody had ever seen up close. The leading edge of an absolutely enormous wall of ice. Thwaites Glacier. The only thing that I have as a visual reference point is that it sort of looks like the wall in Game of Thrones. So, you know, this wall of ice that's probably two times higher than the ship. The ship's like six stories high. And I was really in awe of it. Folks who'd spent more time along ice shelves than I had noticed things that I wouldn't have noticed. They said, like, it looks mangled or gnarly. It looks sick. This is Outside In. I'm Nate Hedgie. And I'm Justine Paradise. And today, we're sharing a behind-the-scenes look at an international expedition to an unexplored part of this world. She told me, it's going to be easier for us to get help to folks on the space station than it is for us to get help to you while you're at the weights. And we'll get to know a glacier which could reshape every coast on this planet. The stakes are... are They range from the personal to the financial to, like, the global. Elizabeth Rush is a writer. We've actually had her on the show before. And her path to Antarctica started long before she ever stepped foot on the boat. I had been writing about sea level rise in particular for, I don't know, over half a decade. And I wanted to, like, see the source. In 2018, she got a -a once-in-a-lifetime offer. A spot on an international research vessel headed to a part of Antarctica that no one had ever been to before. Thwaites. They're deploying an icebreaker this year, and there's one berth remaining, and I recommended it be given to you. It was a dream come true to be invited, truly. To accept, Elizabeth had to put her life on pause. She and her partner had been planning to start a family, but... I found out once I was accepted that pregnant people aren't allowed to deploy to the ice. Because basically, it would be too dangerous. I was 35 at the time, and so, you know, that's like the number that's batted around as like, oh, your fertility starts to plummet in your mid to late 30s. So I felt sort of like squeezed (laughs) um, by this mandate to not get pregnant before going. But I also was kind of curious, like, I'm going to carry that desire with me onto this boat. And how is this mission going to shape that desire? It felt very risky, to be honest. This trip was special, even for a mission to Antarctica. You may have heard of Thwaites' nickname, the Doomsday Glacier. It's called that because if it collapses, the implications for global sea level rise will be profound. It is just absolutely gigantic. It's the size of Florida. It's the size of Great Britain. And it alone contains enough ice to raise global sea levels two feet. It also we think acts as a kind of cork to the entirety of the West Antarctic ice sheet, which um, contains, you know, upwards of 10 feet of global sea level rise. But despite how important it is, scientists had very little firsthand knowledge about Thwaites. Most of it was based on satellite imagery and data from other glaciers. How hard is it to get to Thwaites? 
Well, I'll say this again. We were the first human beings to ever get there, and no one has returned since. Um, so it's extremely hard. <laughs> getting to Thwaites, it's kind of like getting to the summit of Mount Everest, in the sense that there's a short window of time when the weather is good enough to risk it, just four to six weeks. In most years, the sea around the weights is frozen over essentially all year. So the year that we went, there was a really exceptional pocket of unfrozen water directly in front of the glacier's calving edge. They were setting off during the Antarctic summer, when there's 24 hours of daylight at the South Pole. But sea ice conditions can change quickly in the Southern Ocean. And best case scenario, it would take weeks to get to Thwaites. My program officer said a lot of interesting things in the prep for this mission. She told me, it's going to be easier for us to get help to folks on the space station than it is for us to get help to you while you're at the weights. Elizabeth's home for the next eight weeks, her space station, if you will, it was called the RV Nathaniel B. Palmer. It's a type of ship called an icebreaker. This is a serious boat, about the length of a football field and six stories high. And one of the first things she noticed about it was its distinctive color scheme. The hull is the color of a traffic cone, and the rest is painted a kind of egg yolk yellow. One of the Brits looked at me and said, like, what's with the paint job? Was orange on sale or something? Like, it's a goofy <laughs> color, this boat. Um <laughs> But I also wondered, like, if it's bright orange so that, like, people could notice it against the landscape. Um, it certainly stands out. So months after that first call, Elizabeth found herself on a pier in Punta Arenas, Chile, getting ready to board. Before they left port, she and her crewmates had been handed their government-issued cold-weather gear. I thought it was really hilarious. Like the Swedish gear was so sexy. It was like these like full body, like black starship trooper outfits that I was like very jealous of. Um, the Brits were very utilitarian. I felt like they regularly looked like car mechanics. And I was like, you know, they all had sort of like matching, like embroidered insignias and they were a little team. And the U.S. gear was so scrappy. It was hilarious. <laughs> I felt like sort of a mixture of a rubber ducky slash like lobster fisher person. Most scientific expeditions like this have a particular research focus, like sea ice extent, maybe, or deep ocean currents. But because the weights is so important, and because of how difficult and expensive it is to get there, the plan was to gather as much direct observational data as they could. There were a few different science teams on board. The rock team, the sediment team, the submarine team, even an elephant seal team. All told, there are 57 people on the ship. About half scientists, half crew. Among the scientists, there was solid gender parity, about half women, half men. Among crew, a few were women, and the two able-bodied sailors on board hailed from the Philippines. Filipinos are famous sailors, um, but that also has to do with economic need and want, Become working on long-range vessels is a lucrative uh, profession for many in the Philippines. We had two black men on board. Both of them were cooks. And, you know, I think you can kind of see that those people who hailed from families who had access to centuries of economic resources off the boat tended to be the ones conducting the science, and those who didn't tended to be working in support of the scientists. Conditions in the Southern Ocean are, of course, extreme. The water is so cold that if you fell overboard without protection, you'd stiffen and freeze in just minutes. So we left from Punta Arenas, which is uh, the southern tip of Chile. We sailed out the Strait of Magellan, and within a couple of days, we were crossing the Drake Passage, which is the wildest 
reliably wildest ocean passage in the world. There's an ocean current that wraps around the entire continent of Antarctica. And the Drake Passage is essentially its narrowest choke point. We encountered 25-foot seas that basically caused the ship to roll, like rolling back and forth for days on end. Um, so most of my shipmates got really sick. Uh, did you not get sick? I did not get sick. I have never <laughs> been super prone to seasickness. In fact, Elizabeth liked to go to the ship's small gym. Someone had brought along Insanity Max 30 workout videos, and they were made even more interesting by the rocking of the ship. You could, like, be doing jumping jacks, and the ship would be, like, rolling beneath you, and so you would get, like, way more air time in your jumping jack. It was, it was great fun, actually. As exciting as it was to be on this unique, first-of-its-kind mission, much of the day-to-day experience was actually not as thrilling as you might imagine. Many of the scientists and crew would tell me, like, the true challenge of Antarctic fieldwork is the boredom challenge, because you have these extremely long transits in which you're not doing the science. People passed the time in pretty unremarkable ways. They watched movies, they did crossword puzzles, they read pulpy romance novels. There was one aspect of life on the icebreaker, which was particularly important for the morale of all souls on board. Food. So there are four meals a day on the boat. 7 a.m., noon, 5 or 5.30, and then something called midnight rations, which is at midnight. And those four meals, like, ground your day. One of the cooks said something to me that I thought was brilliant. He was like, you know... We aim to put out good food four meals a day because as soon as you're putting crappy food on the line, like the morale goes down. People look forward to meals Um, and we'd get excited. And like, you know, I remember Sam and Wellington was like, wow, this is a big day. One of our cooks came from New Orleans. He did a king cake and we had like a Mardi Gras celebration in the galley. Beyond the card games and the high seas, there were beautiful moments, too whales, a deli penguin sliding off ice floes, flippers akimbo, the ocean, the same yet different every day, and the eerie blue of that first iceberg, and then the hundreds that followed. They'd been at sea for three weeks, and the Palmer was getting close. Maybe 12 hours from Thwaites. The excitement was palpable. And then? And, ah, and then the ship turned around. Then we were all gathered in the computer lab and sort of told this news. One of our shipmates was um, in great physical danger and that we had to get this person to help as soon as possible. The details were mostly kept under wraps, and it was only months after the voyage was over that Elizabeth got the full story. A crew member was pregnant. This was obviously unexpected, because remember, pregnant people weren't allowed on the mission. But in this case, she and her husband were both crew members on board. Elizabeth interviewed her about the medevac much later, and they think the child was probably conceived the day before they left port. But now just hours away from the ice. This person was experiencing extreme abdominal pain. There were concerns that the pregnancy was ectopic, a life-threatening condition. And quite frankly, if that had been the case, she would have died on our boat. Of course, the crew's health is very